Hello, everyone. I hope you are enjoying your food. And uh, uh, at least you know, I am, but I was interrupted by the beautiful lady. Uh, it's time to open the speech, and that's the purpose of the way I hear. Um, thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here for this uh, third round of lunch talks organized by our center to promote uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, I happily recall for the last two rounds of the talks, we had uh, experts um, talking about the uh, geographical and economic applications of the back, back and road historically and um, currently. And then we had uh, a interesting uh, 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 talks about Islamic banking for last round. And those who were here last time would have to record that as well. And today, and uh, th this is a, a, for today's talk, uh, we have uh, Mr. Nick Chen uh, uh, coming to talk about the technological side of the Back and Road Initiative, which honestly is my favorite uh, subject. And uh, I would uh, um, give sort of a, a complimentary explanation of that after uh, Nick's talk. And, uh, and I'm sure you would find the next talk very interesting as well. Now, Nick, please. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Terry. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman, especially. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chen. Directors, uh, Your Excellencies, good afternoon. Um, please continue on with your meal. Uh, I, I don't mind at all. Um, I'll, I'll be going into uh, thinking a bit as well. <laughs> so uh, please continue um, and uh, love to hear from you during the discussion as well. Uh, I'd like this to be interactive. If you have any questions, suggestions, please raise your hand. Um, love to uh, explore that further. Now, um, as uh, Terry introduced, I, I'm Nick Chan. Uh, I have a legal background. Well, I, I work as a lawyer. Uh, I have, um, when I was in university, I did a computer science with a major in artificial intelligence. That was over 20 years ago. And um, since then, I work mostly as a lawyer. Uh, I uh, serve in about 22 countries I've worked in-house. Uh, I serve as a director of one of the global uh, internet search companies. Uh, I work in-house at uh, some uh, international uh, telecom networking technology companies, and, and so on and so forth. So a lot of work I do, and um, I was sitting next to Ms. Fu and she was asking, what do I do as a lawyer? Uh, I do a lot of, um, well, first, you, all of you have lawyer friends, so I would introduce myself more of a technology lawyer, first of all, uh, within the tech, because our firm believe to understand, you know, uh, what the client needs and serve the best interests, you really have to understand the industry first. So a lot of us have a technology background. Mine is in computer science, major in AI. I have colleagues who are, uh, telecom engineers, uh, some of PhDs in chemistry, and uh, today um, I come uh, to share uh, with my insights from those background, and also at the Law Society of Hong Kong, I serve as um, the vice chairman of our uh, Belt and Road Committee. Uh, earlier this morning, we had a big conference, um, still ongoing at the moment, at the convention center. So we have several hundred lawyers uh, gathering to talk about. Um, First topic was, uh, what is the future of lawyers with AI? Um, the wish you have a job left. <laughs> so, you know, let's think. Um, so today I want to explore, you know, as we go forward in, in these countries, uh, Belgian road jurisdictions, with your help, uh, with the adoption of technology, how can we help our, you know, uh, citizens of the world? Uh, how do we help our countries? How do we work together? using technology. So today the statistics being mentioned earlier was 22% um, of lawyer jobs will be replaced, replaceable by AI, 25% uh, of paralegal jobs are replaceable uh, by AI. And then the, um, the Secretary for Financial Services came up and said, you know those figures are gross underestimates. Uh, the, the percentage is a lot higher, uh, so it's about time that we, like today, uh, get together to share together, to explore and think um, how 
we could help uh, professionals and, and other people um, do better. So at the Law Society of Hong Kong, we also have an InnoTech Committee, uh, Inno Technology, Inno, Innovation Technology Committee, InnoTech Committee. Uh, the idea initially was um, to help law firms adopt technology, you know, share with them uh, rather than using, many years ago, rather than using uh, WordPerfect, what, what else can you use? Uh, and then we talked about how we move from BlackBerry uh, to, to other devices. Uh, not not to bad mouth BlackBerry, <laughs> but um, you know now that's easier to input. I, I don't know how many how many of you still use the BlackBerry. Um, I, I I know I know you do. <laughs> now, I did. Right. Well, well I mean I, I I couldn't get myself off the BlackBerry because I didn't know. Um, well, as lawyer, I need to be precise about what I type. I need to be very careful. So with a good keyboard, it's useful. But did, did you know if you're using a smartphone like the iPhone or the Android phones, are you using uh, a special keyboard so that you're not like using your finger tapping away with the words, but you use a swipe keyboard. Have you heard of it? Who knows a swipe keyboard? So, well, if you um, right, right swipe, S, you know, S W Y P is one of them. Yeah. I don't share with them, so I'm not, you know. <laughs> but imagine, you know, well, in the old days anyway, if I type a long email, it's very, you know, I, I hurt my thumb a lot <laughs> with, with typing on the blackberry. But with, with technologies like this, I can just watch N, I, C, K, and I let go, the word Nick comes out. So I can type a sentence as, as fast, if not faster, than my keyboard. And, and you know, I'm a fast typist. <laughs> uh, so anyone needs some typing, let me know. Now, um, so, um, Squire Pen Box, I'm with a uh, US uh, headquartered global law firm, started in the 1890s. Um, perspective I can bring is um, we, we are in 47 places around the world, a single firm, single profit center. A lot of what we do is quite unique as a law firm. Um, so we draft law for governments, we draft competition guidelines, we draft uh, you know, all, all sorts of things. Uh, in the recent US-China trade issues, we, we, we got involved and in the past uh, there were you know, textile export quotas, our, our staff were involved. Uh, we have uh, Speaker of the House uh, from the U.S. Parliament, who uh, you know, um, Congress, who are now with us, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, in the future, um, if you need any input from, you know, how is it done in the U.S. or Middle East or elsewhere, uh, we would love to share. And, and personally, um, I, our firm really supports uh, public service as well as, uh, you know, government developments. So last year, some of you know. I ran in the National People's Congress uh, national elections. Uh, I just missed out. Uh, I'm so-called uh, replacement number one. Uh, so in the next five years, if any one of them from Hong Kong uh, choose not to continue or can't continue, uh, it's automatic that I have to um, serve in that role. So um, I, I'm on borrowed time. I, I'm trying to learn a lot more before I, I serve in that public service. But in that role and also as a council member of the Law Society and other roles I do, such as being a council member of the University of Science and Technology, uh, I get involved in a lot of technology transfer and, and I'm here to uh, share a few words with you on um, tech. Now, um, Belgium Road Initiative. I won't go into detail, you've all heard about it, um, but you know, I think there's some of us in the room who still refer to this as OBOR, uh, you know, OBOR. So the correct knowledge, of course, is to not call this the, the One Belt, One Road. Uh, it's no longer OBOR, uh, it is now PRI. Uh, it's a Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I think the president of China is trying to emphasize it is an initiative. Um, so initiative is something you, you raise it and see what other people think. So it's more, it, it is indeed intended to be more collaborative uh, than you know decided by any one country or individual. So um, as far as I know, you know certainly China uh, needs needs help on this uh, and, and needs a lot of cooperation. And every country around the world is welcome. Uh, it might take it might take some countries a bit longer to turn around <laughs> to support, but uh, I think partly it's about. Um, you know, mutual understanding and, and building that uh, trust. So at the moment, um, you know, the official figure is at least 65 countries, but it's supported by 100 countries. And um, so China is unique in many ways. Uh, in your countries, um, what what type of law do you have, legal system? Hong Kong, not being a country, of course, um, we, we have a common law. Uh, China is, of course, civil law. So when 
you know, uh, in a, if in a room full of lawyers, if I ask what is one country, two systems, they'll go learn say, uh, actually, some lawyers will get it wrong. They go learn say, of course, common law and civil law, the two different legal uh, jurisdictions. But that's obviously right. It's capitalism Socialism. and socialism. Thank you. So, <laughs> right. So, so that is the right answer. Uh, thank you. So, um, but you know, so I, I think what we're dealing with is with 65. This is how we count it: 65, 100 countries. So many different systems. Uh, even in this room, um, you know, we might not agree on everything. So, how do we form a common basis to, to transect along the Berlin Road? Um, I think it will be helpful to use technology. Um, so, simple examples would be like a, like Grab or Uber. Um, you, you know, if you're all on different, you know, taxi uh, stations, you call to reserve a car. You can't reserve everybody. But now. And uh, your life has gotten a lot easier or, or tougher uh, to your private time to yourself, so to speak. Now, and on, on the Belgian road, there's a lot of things we need to harmonize. Uh, recently, I was involved in talking to, uh, I, I, I have a weekly column on headline news. It's a Chinese paper, I apologize, uh, uh, if you don't read Chinese. Um, it's on every Wednesday, and I'm right, you know, just before coming up, I was writing up an article about, uh, because this, today's discussion gave me the idea. Um, how do we transact business more freely and easily, given the different legal systems? And if you think about the past, uh, if you do sales of goods across different countries, you have the um, United Nations, uh, you call it CISG. Uh, it's a way where we sort of predestinate uh, if your contract can be clear about where and when and how the goods are delivered and what condition, then the law or the treaty uh, by by default uh, applies unless you exclude it if it's international sell of goods. So that law came about many years ago in the 1980s, uh, and at the time in the 1980s we didn't have the internet, we didn't have much of the e-commerce. So things have changed somewhat, uh, but have have the law you know, taken place, uh, catch up with reality. So uh, I'm writing something, uh, hopefully published in the next two weeks, to, to talk about that. Uh, but today, I'd like to raise that as a thought starter for, for us to maybe think about whether, you know, we should use more of, um, you know, the old CISG, Sales of Goods Act, or think about if we really want to um, take advantage. But well, see, the CISG, um, the Convention on the International Sales of Goods. When it was drafted, you look at the preamble, it says to you know, to take notes of the new world order, the new world economic order. In the 1980s, we drafted this piece of treaty, this piece of law, uh, which I think by now about 80 countries have, have acceded to. But frankly, I think so many years on, since 1980s, uh, we have a different uh, economic world order, which has shifted more, you know, to to us this side of the world. Um, so, you know, was the law a little bit biased? Uh, because I guess it's biased to the past, biased to the past mode of doing business, and also biased to, um, you know, certain uh, interests. So it is time to think about having something like this, uh, where it's more neutral. I'm not advocating the benefiting one particular country over others, but I'm advocating we should consider uh, having this new sales of goods law, especially uh, applying to countries interested to prosper along the Belgian road, prosper using e-commerce, prosper using technology along the Belgian countries. Um, let's see, um, so BRI, um, Belgian Road Initiative, uh, they state five key goals. I think there's been an overemphasis on one. There's overemphasis on infrastructure. It's true. I mean, you know, um, when when the state leaders come to Hong Kong or we go up there and they ask the lawyers, professionals, say, you guys all think about how you can contribute. Uh, in Belgium Road, the gravy train, you know, hop on it. Uh, it's for you too. A lot of us are scratching our head. Well, why is it relevant to me? We'd like to make it relevant, but how do we make it more relevant? Um, so I think, in a way, this slide provides a bit more answer for. Belgium Road to work, uh, meaning for more trade, more more communication, more people-to-people -people understanding, 
more financial integration and unimpeded trade. What do we need? I, I think we need, like I said, better law, more updated, you know, treaty, um, and uh, maybe maybe a, a more modern way of settling transactions using blockchain uh, and, and other, you know, ICOs. Of course, we have to be careful uh, about, um, you know, uh, know your customers, know your client, uh, anti-money laundering, that kind of issues. But can we still, as modern to authorities around the world, can we still say, well, I, I don't believe in ICO, you know, um, uh, you know uh, so initial coin offering. I don't believe in those cryptocurrencies. Is it a force you can stop? I'm not sure. But I think they try. Countries, governments, um, you know, lo local national banks try to say, these are um, not currencies. First, they say these are not currencies. Uh, let's you know, not give them the status of currency. Then it's realized you, you want to give them the status of currency so you can regulate them. Then, I think the third phase is, uh, as I talk to uh, central banks around the world sometimes in some conferences, as I learned, uh, quite a few of them are thinking of coming up with government state bank uh, cryptocurrencies. Not a bad idea. See, one of the two, I think there are two main uh, misforgivings about cryptocurrency. One is um, it's not backed by anybody. You know, if, if, like the recent one, you know, you might have heard cryptocurrencies are very safe. Uh, but there's been some breaches. Uh, you know, if you use, you know, um, distributed ledger technology, if we all hold a piece of the same uh, document, uh, when someone else outside the room come in and say, what is, what is the real reality? They say it's immutable. You can't change the facts. If, I, if amongst us, at least 51% of us hold the same document, the guy who came in, or the, or the person who came in from the outside, uh, should feel comfortable that the majority copy is a real version. The rest should not fall, should not change. Uh, but the s economy must be big enough. This room must be big enough for people, you know, uh, or packed with more people, so that statistically it's safer. But recently, there's been an attack on one of the cryptocurrencies where somebody temporarily take over 51% of the nodes and were able to, you know, change that and say that is, that is, that is the fact. So we have to be careful about that cyber crime, of course. Um, but the other issue is whether it's backed by the government uh, or a bank. So there's, you know, when you run to the bank, run on the bank, at least there's money waiting for you. But if you run on a cryptocurrency, who's going to bank it if you got cheated? So governments, understandably, are, are conscious and worried uh, for the citizens uh, of being cheated, uh, and you know there will be a big uh, civil unrest. Uh, but yeah, some countries are, are thinking of uh, doing what I mentioned, and you, you too can think about you know uh, pushing for a sandbox idea. Uh, so try it in a controlled environment uh, where people uh, could, could have a taste of it. Uh, Hong Kong, we used to pride ourselves of having um, this autobus car. Uh, I, I think most of us still use it. Uh, most of us now pay with the Apple phone. <laughs> uh, we pay WeChat. Um, you know, I, I was uh, locked up in, in, in the, well, I, I was in a hotel for a whole week of meet, meetings recently in China. Uh, and um, some of us, well, you know, they eat early, right? They're at 6 o'clock. So by, or 5 o'clock, you know, 6 o'clock. By 7 o'clock, you know, we finish the dinner, um, people don't go out. So by 9-ish, people are hungry. Um, so we want to order food, and if you don't have WePay, you can't order anything. Yeah. Right? Um, so, but I think we should go further than that. It's not just about this one country. How do you take advantage of it? What if uh, I can pay uh, across the border without being charged 3 to 5%, you know, all these different credit card companies? Uh, it's a lot easier. Um, blockchain does allow it. Uh, smart contract. Um, I, I want to maybe just jump a bit to smart contract. I don't know how many of you have used smart contract. So the idea of a smart contract, first of all, is it, it's um, the term is a bit of a misnomer. A smart contract isn't necessarily smarter than the non-smart contract, <laughs> but it, it's just essentially um, you use a you reduce. I mean, I'm a programmer as well as a lawyer. So when I draft contracts. I would like the contract to be clear. There's no infinite loops where there's a programming error, 
that you can't understand it can't be sold, right? Same thing. So a smart contract is where you draft a contract in, in a way, a smarter way, so there's less um, less chance of a confusion. So if I say, um, if, um, if I receive $100, uh, this glass of water is yours, I think that's clear enough a contract. So, but if I could put the ownership of the, uh, the, the glass of water into some sort of electronic mode, the title could transfer to you without any more human interaction. So the guy, the person can't just back out. Well, the concept of a smart contract is essentially that. Uh, you promise something, uh, you um, have a way to maybe, let's say India, for example. Uh, anyone from India here today? Um, in, in India, for example, it is pushing for um, pushing uh, land registries, uh, property registries uh, on the blockchain. Uh, so in the future, uh, they, what they could do, uh, I think there are two, two very smart things. One is you could do, and think about if we do this in Hong Kong, wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, you could basically tokenize, fractionalize an ownership of property, and um, you could not have you have put in a smart contract, so kind of auto executed computer code uh, that's tied in with assets, the correct assets, where basically, um, well, it is idea. Now, you, if today uh, we require you to put down a huge deposit by property in Hong Kong, uh, not every citizen could afford it. So when the property price has gone up again, you think you have 50% ready to put down, you don't have 50% anymore, the property gone up. So. But what if we've, we've, we tokenize it, uh, we ask everybody in this room, and, and I'm not doing that now because it would be an illegal collective investment scheme perhaps, I don't want to get caught. Um, but if I ask everybody to say, look, um, this Tai Kuching property, I'm going to define it to 100 equal shares. You could all buy 1% of it, um, but I say 1% is one token, I only issue 100 tokens will represent that real estate property. So if you all buy one token, over time, you can swap and buy from other people to the point where, let's say, you achieve more than the majority. We can discuss what is majority. Let's say, you know, 15, 25, or 50%, whatever it might be. Once you get that point, the computer will force other uh, token owners to sell to you if you wanted it. You could exercise kind of like a pool, a call option. You can buy them out uh, at, at special rates. Um, so you would all, not, not the new rate, so you would all share in the appreciation of the property price because now you all could enter the market earlier and uh, can, can share the appreciation. And you, you know you don't need to worry about being stuck with uh, being a 1% owner of a property where you, you, can't, you can't liquidate it, you, you can't realize it. But with, with, you know, with blockchain, with um, smart contract, it can be done. As an example. Now, um, back to the slide, you I may. Uh, any questions so far? I might not have explained it as well as I, I should have. A any time, feel free to put up your hand and discuss it further. Um, so, uh, drawing people closer. Now, uh, talk about infrastructure. People mostly talk about the AIIB uh, and always oh, the infrastructure play. It's not just an infrastructure play. Um, if you were, um, if you can't get the interest of the people, the will, uh, cooperation, it's how to move things around and get people to agree to things. So, um, the digital information super uh, is key. Um, you, you can read it on the slide, so I, I don't have to read it word for word. But um, the idea is, um, it's not just an infrastructure play, it is meant to be a digital smart space and road, uh, and to participate and benefit uh, from the digital Silk Road, um, how can uh, we turn ourselves into uh, smart cities, so to speak? Um, and you see in Hong Kong, recently been able to uh, move, um, you know, research funding from mainland China across the river uh, to Hong Kong. Uh, and you also see in the recent um, so-called US-China trade war, or, um, or the fee of it, um, that I think it's a good time uh, to have Hong Kong as a significant research and development center. So that you know, the chips that CTE can't buy from the US, uh, maybe if they were researched here, created here, 
it won't be subject to trade barriers. So there are some serious discussions going on uh, on that front. Um, so um, we should uh, take note and see how ourselves and, and our citizens could all take advantage of it. The Information Silk Road, uh, it's coined uh, by, the, by the central government, and they, they support this a lot. Naturally, a good spokesman, uh, ambassador, is uh, Mr. Jack Ma. Um, so he, he always has really good quotes, doesn't he? Um, mm -hmm. Now, um, so uh, I think companies like that have uh, a, a lot to write on the success of the Silk Road, uh, Belt and Road. Um, they, I mean, you know, if, if, if you or your country's fellow citizens are in e-commerce, uh, it wouldn't be easier. A, a, lot, a lot of the uh, virtual jurisdictions, um, the infrastructure development, it's still, you know, a tad bit underdeveloped. So uh, do we want to start thinking of using drones uh, to move things around? Uh, but then you're going to have to use a satellite positioning system. And so what did the Chinese government do? Um, they express uh, interest to open up more of the, you know, the the Beidou, um, you know, satellite system to facilitate this kind of business. Uh, and you know, I don't know how many of you fly around, will play with drones, but the, the one of the world's most successful drone company is here uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a, a student of the USD. Uh, it, the company is called DJI. Uh, so very successful story. You know, many Chinese citizens came to Hong Kong to study uh, and then set up shop in Hong Kong across the border in Sunjin. Did very well. Um, the statistics say it's probably worth over 10 billion US dollars and it has over maybe 70-80% of the market uh, for drones around the world. So if they work together, it would be, be quite interesting, wouldn't it? Um, so I also work on some uh, technology companies, X projects, uh, where uh, the idea is also, um, you know, global retailer companies, uh, and they want to do it in the U.S. to, to deliver the drones. So, so think about maybe in your own countries, um, as you said, all consul generals here. Um, do your country have laws that allow delivery by drones? And how? But but even then, how do we make sure it's done safely uh, without hurting hurting the citizen? Uh, and can the drones then fly across the border? If I have a warehouse just on my side of the border, can we just fly over and deliver? Uh, what if the spectrums, um, they conflict with each other and they cause interference? Uh, we, we have um, friends uh, and consul from uh, Myanmar today. Uh, I was honored to, to serve uh, the country in opening up its uh, you know, mobile market. I can't go into details or I might be in a bit of trouble. <laughs> but, uh, but it is an honor. And it, it, communication is such an important thing. So Belt and Road isn't just about road infrastructure, but communication infrastructure is essential. Um, and common language is, is, is very, very, very important as well. So let's think about how we break down the trade barriers, digital trade barriers. Um, you know, you have more IP addresses, right? ICANN is coming up with more. Uh, internet addresses over time, um, but you know how can we facilitate them better? And and let, let's talk about tax. If you move things across the country, do you tax them in the same way? Uh, some countries are are playing very smart. They say, um, well, when well, um, some well, many years ago, I joined an international uh, technology networking company. Uh, I, I was the Asia Pacific, uh, kind of like the Deputy General Counsel. Uh, I was surprised all the transactions were done using a Netherlands company. Um, you know, so what was organized was a, a director lives in the Netherlands, uh, the server to accept the, the purchase uh, are done in the Netherlands. Think about contract law, basic contract law. Contract is not formed until there's an offer and you, someone accepted it. So you have to be careful where you put the person that accepts it. So the person that accepts it would have an impact on the applicable law and therefore also the applicable uh, tax uh, of that particular transaction. So, you know, there could be things we could think about. Uh, my Hong Kong tax is quite low. Uh, there are other places with no tax, of course. Um, so, but then double tax treaty would mean if you keep dealing, using com 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 companies in countries with no tax, uh, you could be penalized uh, in a way, uh, negatively penalized. 
effectively. So how do you deal for that? Uh, it, it takes some thinking and some cooperation. Um, let's see. So how do you bring people together? Um, events like this. Uh, I, I thank um, Jim and Joseph for bringing us together. <laughs> how, how, how do we, uh, you know, in organizations like this and uh, also other organizations. Um, so how, how do we do it together? Um, video conference, uh, WeChat, um, you know, a lot of things we could do. Uh, you know, uh, the, the high-speed railway is useful, right? We, we get closer, you have a, it's like a full hour live circle, you don't go beyond. Um, creating common language and experience. In terms of common language, that's okay. uh, in terms of common language, you have um, Google, for example, or Facebook, for example, right? I think you might have heard, they had to suspend a project because the programmers asked the computer to come up with a efficient language. Imagine we come up with a single efficient language and the computer, Facebook program is trying to do it. And what happened was the computer keeps simplifying their common language to the point where the computer is happily talking to themselves and the programmer no longer understand what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's scary, right? AI. AI. Um, so, so I think AI, we have to get to a point where, uh, and as lawyers, we were also concerned. Uh, so, uh, in September this year, uh, the Law Society is holding, uh, I hope you don't mind, just brief mention, ho 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 hosting a Belgian Law Conference. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the ethics of AI. Uh, you know, when is it too AI, too much? Um, you know, so what if computers are given the opportunity to, to choose whether or not uh, you will be served by McDonald's? You go to McDonald's and they look at your profile, they have everything, they then mention, look at your Facebook, you know, um, you, you know or, or they think you're too healthy to go in or not healthy. <laughs> right? So, profiling. You walk in, you don't get served. Why don't you get served? No, you're not of our profile. You're not, you're not a target audience. Is that that wrong for them to decide what they sell to? They make less money, but you know, to, to, to some of us, it's too much. Uh, profiling and where decisions are made, whether you get served, whether you can get a job, uh, you know, they predict it. You know, these days, I, I go to China and some places, they say, oh, we're so good. Um, with the, um, y if you go to our court to do a litigation, before, uh, litigation starts, we're going to use big data and look at the past cases and tell you your chance of success. And look, so many cases got settled before it started. I'm just thinking, if, if, I, if I'm a plaintiff or claimant, you know, you know, in that case, I walked in and a judge sit down with me outside and say, look at our technology. Uh, you have 2% chance of winning. Uh, do you still want to continue? And what's worse, not, not just I look at it, the judge look at it. They just look at the predictive ruling <laughs> before, the, before the ruling starts. Um, so, does the judge really want to deviate from the computer that much? I, I, I don't know. Uh, because the computer is suggesting it, it is uh, looking at the past case precedent. Of course, China, mainly in China, civil law country, it's not meant to just, it's not really meant to follow case precedent. Um, but that's interesting too. So, earlier I was mentioning uh, common law, civil law. Maybe, maybe I'll go into that a bit more. Um, in a uh, in a civil law country, um, well, so let's think about um, what is civil law. Civil law stands for civilian law. It's more like in the Roman you know, uh, Empire, uh, the law doesn't really apply to the non-civilian, uh, the, the king, the emperor. So we're going to have a law. Um, to call it civilian law looks a bit rude. Let's just call it civil law, very civilized. But it's not civilized law, it's civilian law. So it's a law where the, the emperor uh, dictates uh, what you should do. But then more detail. Uh, Rome, uh, you know, or Augustus and uh, you know, Julius Caesar, they want to be more better known for um, having fair, uh, you know, equal rules across, uh, I wouldn't say kingdom, it's one king kingdom for them. Uh, but, you know, across different jurisdictions, geography, right? So that's civil law. So in the civil law, the laws are very detailed. Uh, the, the laws are detailed. The China laws are more detailed compared to Hong Kong. Um, so in civil law jurisdiction, because you're really only meant to rule on a case looking at what the law says, then looking at in a, then a common law jurisdiction. Now, common law, 
Uh, what is common law? Uh, we, we think of, we, you know, I think most of us in this room think very highly of common law. We grew up with common law. But common law, it, it's, you know, in, in the old days in the England, um, so in, in, the, in the kingdom, uh, what, what it is is the king will give decrees about how certain things are done. Uh, and the king, you know, is too busy to come up with detailed law about everything. Right? Well, understandably, um, big country to, to uh, take you know, empire to take care of. So what do they do? Um, so you rely on someone else to help out. The judges help out. The judges would, would based on the limited laws, then apply rule of equity. Uh, I, I'm not badgering, you know, uh, our, our common law jurisdiction. I, I, I really like our common law jurisdiction, but I just want to share the background. Um, so, so that's why under common law jurisdictions, lawyers, judges, uh, we will always look at the case law, because if a case in the past have similar facts, if it ruled in a certain way, uh, lower courts. Same courts, you know, in the future, generally are bound to follow. Uh, so that's why we so there's the same judge-made laws. You know, some say no, let's call make laws, not judge-made laws. But no, uh, you know, that it's fair to say judge do make laws in a common law jurisdiction. So if judge make laws, that's why judgments tend to be longer with reason. Uh, civil law jurisdictions, judge don't make laws. Um, that's why um, sometimes people criticize why. The, the decision is so short. You just say, you know, your decision, but you didn't give the reason. Um, you, you're hiding the reason. It's just traditionally there are differences. Now, um, I, I mentioned China, but I didn't meant to limit that to just apply to China. I'm saying along our Burton Road, we have, you know, continental law, civil law, common law, uh, you know, and Islamic law, and so on and so forth. So, how do we harmonize it? If we all come into a transaction with our own preconceived um, you know, right or wrongs, it, it doesn't really work. We're going to argue. So that's why I'm advocating, um, you know, taking into account technology, come up with a modern form of CISG, um, and so forth. Now, let me continue. Uh, so, um, a lot of lawyers in Hong Kong didn't use you, just share the you know, professional and, and antidote evidence. We, a lot of us don't use, um, we, you know, uh, WhatsApp, in the, or we, we chat in the past. Right? I mean, now, I mean, a lot of my overseas US based clients, they all have WeChat. They ask me to, you know, they send me the QR code and ask me to add them uh, on WeChat. Um, but, you know, it's useful, right? If you share, I mean, if you share a photo like this today, if you take a good photo of me, I would say, uh, please send it to me by WeChat because I can get the full resolution. If you say by WhatsApp, it's reduced resolution, right? Um, and I, I think now you can, but in the past you couldn't open PDF on, on WhatsApp, so you still go to WeChat. So, um, uh, you know, we don't have to support a particular you know, uh, technology or company, but generally, communication platform is important. Um, and, um, you know, in Africa, it's already 5 million users using, using WeChat. And if you have the platform, you can also do payment, you can also transact, you can also sell your business. Um, one of the very successful Chinese legal business is um, they use a WeChat group. Like, I think it's under the column of social something and social interest. And then there's a group. Uh, again, I don't want to share them, uh, but I, you know, they came down and spoke with them. And they say uh, they have how many millions of people on this WeChat group, uh, and then people can ask questions, uh, and there are lists of people who are allowed to answer back in those chats, and they get paid uh, doing so. But not the initial answer. It's been, you know, you may to do some free free service first, but it's fair enough. But it, it is opens up a huge market. Uh, are, are we all taking advantage of platforms like that in our own countries? Our citizens, our countrymen, our businessmen. Are we doing that? We, we should think about that. Not not limit ourselves to to what we have in Hong Kong, uh, WhatsApp, for example. Uh, uh, and um, on online stores, amazing. I, I hope one of the uh, global um, you know, companies, they spend 60 million US dollars just to invest in their online uh, online store, uh, targeting just one country, one you know, important country. Um, so, you know, what it would be so much more efficient if that could be used to target other countries too. Oh, I think a lot of you have received a lot of emails from friends and colleagues and businesses uh, with the title GDPR, right? Yeah. Um, General Data Protection Regulation. 
uh, from the EU. Um, so something like that is good and bad. It's, you know, it, it has extra territorial application. Uh, if you operate a website out of Hong Kong, you don't delimit who can visit. Or in fact, you target people from around the world, including those who are living in the EU. And you sell them something, or you try to sell them something, and you collect the personal data. You are already caught by the law. In theory, they could, uh, if, you know, if you don't do things right, you could be charged 20 million euros, or 4% of your global turnover, uh, as it is. It's, it took effect on the 25th of May. Um, and so, you know, um, but these laws, you know, is it good? I mean, if you live in the EU, it's a good thing for you, in a sense. You, as a normal citizen, every citizen, you have a right to be forgotten. A lot of people write a lot of things about you on the internet. You can just write the internet provider and say, take my name off. I want to be forgotten by the world, on the internet at least. Um, so that can be done in the EU. It can't be done here yet. It's a good thing, bad thing. I mean, you know, um, a lot to think about. Uh, but technology could make a big difference. Uh, in the future, I can see if a, if a technology company, you know, cloud service provider, you know, says, you know, software as a service kind of provider, if they tell me, oh, um, my, my operations are GDPR compliant, immediately you go, whoa, um, can't be bad. Uh, you know, the technology, you know, I'm ready to use the platform uh, because I know it's, it's higher than the highest uh, regulation required. Um, they make distinction uh, about the different, um, uh, you know, personal data. So your medical records, your, your personal life, uh, you know, who you mingle with, uh, nocturnal activities, these are considered special categories of personal data and are to be protected. Uh, and you're, you know, you're not to be profiled based on these. Um, so uh, companies like JD.com, they are going to, apparently, uh, setting up 20 more overseas warehouses uh, to transfer goods. Uh, I went to, uh, I think, um, Hanan, uh, uh, in one of the provinces in China, and I was surprised. They say, oh, we own, I don't know, I think 50 or 51 percent of uh, uh, the national aircraft uh, carrier um, in, in Luxembourg. Um, so it, it immediately clicked, because Luxembourg is a, is a very special place uh, from a tax perspective. Uh, if you move goods into the EU, into one of the more preferential tax places, and then you move the goods around from there, you're already in the EU, you're not bound by those additional tax barriers, you're already in there. So not sure, I mean, if we are all in this room, or we all want to uh, make a BRI a success, uh, is there something along these lines we can think about uh, and, and worth exploring? Um, if we can't get everyone to agree to it, it's hard. It's taken, like the New York Convention, 30 years to get general acceptance. Uh, but we could start with a few countries and, and add to them. Uh, the space space product I mentioned earlier, um, you could use uh, the satellite uh, space uh, to, to provide uh, technology, to provide, provide connectivity, uh, to allow people to communicate. You know, when you have communication, you have telehealth, you have telemedicine, um, you know, you can really help people a lot, and, and I'm really interested, in, I've done some of these projects, and we, we should do more of it. Uh, you could, you know, sometimes we think outside the box, you have the technology, uh, your, your local citizens don't really need it, um, you know, because the standard living is so much higher where, where we are sometimes. Um, so, you know, if we think about how we could, you know, more better connect with people there, you know, a lot of people don't have fixed lines. A lot of people um, don't use banks. Uh, they use micro payments. Um, you know, how can we make the most out of it? Uh, it's something we should all consider. Um, big data is a big deal, as we see in uh, lots of recent elections and so forth. Um, and Kazakhstan, anyone from Kazakhstan here today? Um, so they want to develop themselves as a Central Asia tech hub. Uh, and so they you know, they, they welcome a lot of people, especially fintech startups, to go there. And um, what about our respective jurisdictions? What are we doing uh, to, to attract, um, be part of it? So to build trust, um, we talk more, uh, we get together more. Food sharing, um, uh, literally. <laughs> now, to fight frauds. Um, so if, there's a lot of shipping involved, right, with the, with the Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road. 
So um, the idea, of course, it's happened already. Apart from using uh, RFID and different ways of more quickly uh, see what's being moved, uh, you can use blockchain. So that again, smart contract. Once you agree to something, once the condition has reached, for example, the goods have been delivered, uh, someone has scanned it at the port uh, to say your goods have arrived. Um, you're able to somehow tell that the temperature has not deviated, probably is still fine. Um, it's not been subject to any fire, burn, something, you have detection. Uh, you know where they went, uh, you feel comfortable, you could, you know, buy cheaper insurance that way, uh, because, you know, it's more predictable. And you lower the transaction costs, things get moved around a lot quicker, things don't get stuck um, in uh, the, the bonded warehouse, and um, you could, you know, once things arrive, money, uh, there's a pain. No, we talk about, but, you know, standby letter credits, you know, LCs, there are better ways than LCs. Um, so some of us in this room already use a lot of e-checks. So I think, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement and development. We should think about that. Um, also, uh, when you deal with a counterparty, do you know who they are? How do you really know they are who they are? Um, so earlier this week, I got a call, I got an email from a US colleague telling me about what happened in the Middle East. We have a client who's been defrauded, you know, about a hundred million US dollars. Uh, someone did phishing, someone pretended. Phishing as in P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, not phishing. Um, so someone pretended to be the CEO and moved the money uh, to a bank in Hong Kong. So I happened to get up early usually. So at 6.30 I got the email. Uh, by 7.30 before the bank opened, uh, we were lucky. We, we, we have you know, good relationship uh, and good processes, of course. Uh, and we, we got the police to pay good attention uh, to the matter. And <laughs> so, so we stopped the money. Um, but you know, how do you know you was or was not the CEO. I don't know how many of you have uh, got the e-certificate, e-ID from the Hong Kong Post Office. It's free for everybody. I don't think any one of us in this room have it. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to say I don't have it. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, you don't have the economy of scale, people don't use it. You still have a better, better way to ascertain who is who. Um, not to say to allow all these big brothers to watch over us. It's okay if we have a unique, you know, unique way of saying signature. Uh, of saying who we are, and it can't be stolen, can't be, the signature can't be forged. Uh, blockchain, DLT, uh, you know, DAO, new technologies are making this possible. Uh, I was just thinking, I, I saw this movie, I think it's called Time, or is it Timeless? You run around and you, run, you know, you have this um, counter, it's a movie. Uh, you, you, be, before you run out of time, you have to buy credit to buy more time, otherwise you die. Anyone oh, seen that movie? Yes. Really cool movie. Uh, really cool movie. Yeah. It's got time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that's the idea. So everyone uh, is based on a centralized database. Um, thinking, I mean, if it's protected properly, if it's protected properly, um, you don't need to worry about children uh, going to a bar and buying a drink. I mean, that never worked anyway. In the UK, when I lived for a little while, people buy a drink and leave it on the table. Or when the bar is supposed to close at 10, just before 10, what do we do, right? We we'll order a drink for the whole table and then start you know, drink until midnight. Um, so, but anyway, there, there are technology around that we can make better use of. In yes. time. In time, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're gonna send us a key to that? Yeah, Justin, <laughs> Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake, good movie. Um, yeah, it's true. Look at it, it's a quite a futurist movie. Um, I, I quite like it. Um, so how do we abuse all this? How can we use technology? Now, come an IT platform useful. Hong Kong has a, um, say, if you ask a Hong Kong judge or Hong Kong government, uh, you know, civil servant, we would always say the law is always ready for you. Uh, we don't need to upgrade our law just for the technology. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we came up with a electronic transactions ordinance to remind people uh, that we, we did make a change. Um, but did we really, I'm not, to be frank, I, I think the law is already there. Um, we don't, didn't really need it, but just for people to feel more comfortable. But what it does, the electronic transaction ordinance is uh, one particular rule that's interesting, I thought, is, is it designated, if we designated a particular IT system uh, as our agreed communication system, imagine all our countries together designate this, um, you would 
greatly simplify transactions and arguments. Now, um, if I have an offer, you, you offer me, I accepted it, there's a contract. What if you offered to me, I um, ignored the message, but somehow, I mean, I didn't click, I re read receipt or something, right? I don't send it back to you. You don't know whether I read it, you can't prove it. You think I read it, you can't prove it. But not by my actions, I must have read it. Otherwise, how do I know to deliver the goods to you? How did I know? So, anyway, these things could still be proven, but it takes time, it takes cost. We can earn more, but it's not good for business. Lawyers can earn more, <laughs> it's not good for business. Um, so, what do you do? So, the electronic transaction ordinance allow uh, importers, exporters to generally designate uh, a government, you know, a semi-government, um, trade industry association, you know, what do you call it, the TIC, um, web, web, uh, information portal, so that if you send messages to that portal, uh, regardless of whether the other guy person read it, you have sent it to them. You know, they can't pretend. So, if we could do this on a bigger scale, not just for Hong Kong, but we think about this for, for the rest of us, um, you know, along the Burton Road, uh, then we know we can all play fair. We don't need to play those games about, I didn't receive it, um, things will get on a lot quicker, uh, and we, we could better see people's uh, past history. You know, there are a lot of likes. I know there are fake likes on Facebook you could buy. <laughs> but, but, you know, generally, if you could rate each other, rate law firms, rate other service providers, it's not a bad thing. Bear in mind, of course, the right to be forgotten. <laughs> now, um, so, Ruth, I'm tracking up about some of this. Uh, so, um, costs. Uh, so, a lot of, now in the past, uh, I'll talk, I was talking to some logistics association people. They were saying, oh, in the past, we could um, have a jit hub, you know, just in time up somewhere. We can leave it there for a few days. Uh, in the, you know, let, let's say if you want to deliver to, to Hong Kong, you just have something, let's say even in Singapore, and, you know, as long as you get here a few days later, people accept it. Now people don't. Like, uh, my, my daughter wanted to buy something from Amazon before her outbound camp. Um, you know, on a, on a Wednesday, she told me she needed it by Saturday. So, uh, I go, you know, I go, I go, uh, let's, let me go to you know, um, Alibaba, Taobao to look at it. So, no, no, my friends could do uh, Amazon. I was amazed. It, it took two days from the US to arrive. Um, the, the curry cost cost more than the item she was buying. <laughs> um, but at least it got here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, thinking back, the logistics company is saying they really need pe things to be on the ground. People really don't accept five day delivery. Shorter. So technology can help you think of how you know the likes of Uber and Grab. They tell where the cars should be placed before people place an order. You know they have big data. They know what time, what day, where is a good place to wait for passengers for for longer longer haul ride. Um, can't we do that? You know, I, I people or friends who, who who work for courier companies, for cargo plane companies. Um, but if you have the benefit of this, this is so much better. Because big data could be too much, you know. I, I, if any one of you uh, have uh, Facebook uh, ins app installed on your phone, now I hope this is not on because I'm, I'm going to upset somebody. <laughs> uh, on this video. So, the Facebook, uh, I don't think they, I don't fix it yet. But the according, oh, but I didn't say it. But according to some report, uh, Facebook app listens in on conversations in order to give you good suggestions. So. You know, um, so it happened. I was uh, talking to somebody about going to um, where's our Vietnam concentration, Mr. Chen. Mr. Chen. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, so I was talking to someone about I'm going to Vietnam to do some cooking with some lawyers, and all of a sudden, uh, later on, I go to Facebook. Oh, nice! Uh, you know, automatic uh, advertising. Uh, you know, not for not for me, but I, I see ads for good hotels in Vietnam, best places to visit. It's there. You know. Now, it's either what I say or, or what I said to another communication app, which is now owned by Facebook. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah. um, so, so lawyers in particular, we don't just have WhatsApp nowadays. We have uh, WeChat and uh, we have, uh, I think, is it Telegram? Um, if we don't mind the Russians looking at it. Uh, so, so anyway, um, I, I hear you know, uh, lawyers who do corporate finance, who do listing, um, they choose the different app for different reasons. <laughs> um, so, uh, scientific exploration, uh, so that all opportunities. I want to uh, pause, how, how am I doing time? I want to talk about how do we solve disputes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, running? Oh, running. Okay. Now I'll talk quickly. Um, so I, I am uh, serving as chairman of an organization called EBRAM, uh, EBRAM Center, the Electronic Belt and Road Arbitration Mediation. Uh, the acronym stands for that. So what we're doing is to uh, find. Uh, it is a it's a uh, it's a non-governmental project. It's a um, pro you know private citizen uh, initiative. We want to start a, a place, a way with the right rules and technology to facilitate disputes resolution, uh, including investment disputes that entities specialize in. So if you invest in a country, uh, what if that country uh, doesn't you know, honor the transaction in a way that you expect? You know, they might not be wrong, just that you could have expected wrongly. <laughs> but you know, we, we are thinking of ways, uh, we will go live next year. Um, so here's a quick one, a photo I took when I was in Beijing. Uh, you know, uh, Supreme People's Court in Beijing. So um, most of the court cases now are broadcast live. I know in the US they do for some cases, more for fun, I think. But uh, in, in China, uh, you can sit in the room, you can look at, you know, uh, screens beamed in from, you know, 60, 70 courts or more in China. At least the room I got in had that. I'm sure there are more rooms and more cameras. Uh, but but it, was, it was good. You, you could see, um, you know, justice being done better. Uh, and, and it was a really good thing. So I, I, I talked about eBrand. If I'm running out of time, I, um, that ends, concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think you can go back to your Thank you. Well, I feel you're for a while, but you have to come back for questions. So please. <laughs> um, thanks again, um, Nick, for the uh, wonderful talk, and uh, to be honest, uh, I feel a bit uh, scared by your talk because uh, I, I think you know we either have to face uh, the analytical kind of uh, eavesdropping or the litigation risk, uh, and you guys have to help us out, right? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, uh, that's, it is, that's a really interesting talk against, uh, as I said at my opening uh, speech, that is my favorite, personal favorite topic as well, because uh, I did my own, uh, own venture uh, on uh, uh, mobile technology uh, uh, field, that is uh, um, O2O, uh, offline, online to offline. Uh, offline to online, and uh, I think I had a first-hand experience of how exciting uh, this uh, uh, tech, uh, new technologies could be to uh, the business development uh, as we are right uh, experiencing, and even to our a, uh, a personal life. And uh, uh, my co my company actually was the very first one uh, which urged in a WeChat Pay into Hong Kong. But now we see uh, WeChat Pay is being uh, uh, localized as well. Um, well, you know, that's, uh, that, that's you know, uh, what uh, uh, Nick helped me to recall, my good old days. And uh, back to the subject uh, which Nick, uh, you know, lectured us on, that is technology on uh, a better road initiative. I think that, uh, you know, he, uh, Nick, you are really on, right on the money about the necessity and need for it. And do, uh, uh, because of uh, my own experience with my own O2O um, o o venture, actually I felt, and especially after I left my business and begin to reflect on the further need of it for it in today's world, uh, in the context of uh, BRI, I think it's actually not, not only necessary and needed, and it's urgent actually. And uh, you know, uh, as part of my comment of, uh, of on what you said, uh, concretely, uh, you know, technologically, uh, we should have some technology as you know a widely accepted um, uh, uh, QR code um, <coughs> applications together with uh, blockchain technologies, which you had to spend uh, quite, a, quite a lot of time on just now. And all those, you know, are, are real, are concrete technologies should be explored to see how they can, they can help to bring us together, as you rightly put it, for this Belt and Road initiatives. 
that's a really right direction we should go. Well, that's my comment. And I have, are you finished with your, with your dessert? Yes. And please come back to the floor and receive the questions. I'm sure there are quite a few. Please. You want to know how the horses will go? <laughs> it's okay. Anyone? Which is the one I gave you? You always need one to begin. Then. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, maybe introduce yourself, maybe. Not okay. Anyone. I'm Anna Vishpiller and I'm the Consul General of ISRA. Hello. I've been here for 10 months and um, the Bell and Road Initiative, you know, it's, um, we hear about it for few years now. Yes. Um, a lot of it is that is a big vision and um, and an idea that actually a lot of technology companies are wondering how could they fit in yes. with it. So hoping that you're a, a tech lawyer, right? Yes. Um, because most of the things that we know that the initiative is basically a lot of connecting infrastructure or major infrastructure project. How do you see or how could you advise the smaller technology uh, companies? I'm not talking about the big guys, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, the smaller technology companies, how could they fit in, in the initiative and how, what advice can you give them? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how, I mean, Israel does such a great job with uh, technology. Um, I, I, I spent quite a few visits to Israel. Okay. Um, no, I, I think first is Belt and Road Initiative brings about a much bigger market. So if you're a small technology company, you really, like you said, you don't need to worry about the infrastructure. Let someone else build the railway, let someone else do that. Um, but as a technology company, how can you make it more scalable? Right? How can you access the new market. For example, um, you think about the main languages used. You could be a technology company, I mean, you know, some are just software, some, you know, nonetheless, there's a look and feel to things, right, with technology apps, for example. Um, so, you know, FinTech, it's, it's quite, quite good there uh, in Israel as well. So, technology companies, if you think about interface, uh, it's not just, sometimes not just about language translation. You have to be built with other people's culture in mind, what they're used to. So at eBrand, for example, we're talking to technology companies about translation, instantaneous translation, uh, between Chinese, Arabic, Russian, and some other languages. So if you know the geography of um, Belt and Road, the languages they speak, the culture, and the likes and dislikes, you know, you can't serve everybody, but if you look at the big picture, how can we go from a small tech company in a country to many more countries. What do they need? Um, so I think by design, sometimes it could be reinventing um, rather than you know, sticking with, you know, uh, I work in knowledge transfer, right? So a lot of professors, they believe in what they do is the best in the world. And I'm proud of them, I believe in them. But it's not what the world needs. So what does the world need? You know, what does Belgium Road, what do they need, right? So. With that in mind, you tweak a product. Uh, for example, for technology, you know, China has this China uh, cyber security law, right? As many of you know, uh, with a data residency requirement. So under the data residency requirement, which is also in Russia, uh, you cannot move personal data outside of that jurisdiction. So Apple, for example, has started to build a lot of data centers before the law came into effect early this year. So if we want to attack the Russian and Chinese market, so to speak, you know, the consumers to, to make money from that, we have to take that in mind. And we have to build the, build the service, the infrastructure with that in mind. Um, so if we can't, we work with somebody who has, uh, who has, you know, kind of like an Amazon web service, you know, work with the cloud. Is that possible? Um, so, you know, uh, I, 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 I mean, as a lawyer, kind of way in a, a businessman as a lawyer. Um, we have to look at the macro, I look at the macroeconomics. I look at initially, yes, all infrastructure, railway, then we start to look at 
technology companies that provide safety for the railway, then you start to learn and realize the track width is different. Uh, you know, once you go into Russia and now, you are stuck. The train can't go further because of different standards. Then you've got to negotiate the standards. I was helping out with a technology company uh, who now allow all of us to go on Cafe Pacific and most other aircraft airline. Um, you could use Wi-Fi and uh, GSM. We, we went to 165 countries uh, in advance. Uh, now, 5G is coming, for example. Right? So, with the third of 5G, are we prepared? I mean, there are new business models that are going to be enabled by 5G. You think of the rollout timetable for these countries. You know, there are some services that don't need to use 5G. But if you have a lot of content, um, user-generated content, you want to have 5G. It's good. Um, so, if I was doing something that couldn't take advantage of 5G or couldn't take advantage of facial recognition or whatever, then I, I should think about, you know, moving my direction. Um, my technology can do this and also these, but often companies forget these other things which are more scalable, more attractive, um, but it, only because they started off just doing this in the first customer business. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Nick. Joseph. <laughs> Joseph, Terry, Tony, you're here. Laurie, where's Laurie? Laurie, I wanted to thank you all for yet another great get together. I haven't met many of the team before, but some of you will be familiar with me. Um, I'm here actually trying to sell my product, which is in fact maps of the Silk Road and the Greater Bay area and so on and so forth. But what I'm going to say, I know, puts me into a position where some of you will feel that you don't want to have anything to do with me. Because I want to talk, if I may, for a second about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is not China. The elephant in the room is the other side of the coin, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I feel that we're in a world which is desperately threatened by things that none of us seem to want to talk about in business. We don't want to talk about global warming climate change, which I think is the biggest business opportunity ever. In America, big business, some big business, coal particularly, they want to be in denial. But why be in denial about climate change? We can't stop it, but it's enormous business opportunity for us. And there are companies in Shenzhen and in China and in Western China who are obviously taking advantage of that. Nuclear war is a huge problem. Pandemics with Trump winding down the Center for Disease Control. New diseases that are coming with um, Trump, the climate change are enormous threats for us. And I feel, I feel very much because we experienced it very badly here in Hong Kong, H5N1 is just the beginning. It's like the trailer for something that with our cities of over 20 million people, many of them high-speed transport by plane usually. But I go to these forums, I come to these forums, I don't go to them, I come to them because I want to come. But it, it, it concerns me that the business opportunities in the four items I've just discussed are never raised because we, we're frightened, I think, of these things. And I think the message of the Silk Road is a bridge between East and West. I'm a, a Scotsman, I've lived here for over 40 years. I love China, I consider myself to be half Chinese, actually. But I care very much about the distance. Yesterday I was uh, doing a conference in Warsaw on Skype, and the Europeans are frightened of China. Get real, guys. If you don't think they are, they are. We have a big PR job to do, and it's a job that I would love to be involved in. Anyway, enough said. But I'd like to end in the spirit of the Silk Road. The spirit of the Silk Road is not just about silk and about um, treasures. It's about our spiritual interrelationship between East and West. So this little poem is dedicated to this forum. And again, excuse me speaking my mind, but I think we do need to address these things and not be in denial. So this is a Silk Road poem. My heart, by is Muslim. My heart is open to all the winds. It is a pasture for gazelles, which I take as being Taoism in my center, because I'm a Taoist rather than anything else at the moment. And a home for Christian monks, a temple for Hindus, the black stone of the Mecca pilgrim, the tablet of the Torah and the book of the Quran. Mine is the religion of love. Wherever God's caravans turn, the religion of love shall be my religion. 
and my faith. We have to put nationalism to one side. The problems facing the world are too great for us to think in terms of America and China. If, if we want to talk about these things, let's talk about Beijing and, and, and Washington, because the whole of our countries are not involved. These are not our responsibilities, but we have to turn to one another as brothers and sisters, regardless of race and regardless of culture, or we won't have any home for our grandchildren or even more seriously our great grandchildren. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry, it's not a question. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Thank you. So I'll um, pass it back to Terry. Um, but in the time, uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I thank uh, Chairman Joseph uh, for bringing me here. Thank you, Anthony and friends. Uh, glad to meet you all. And if we could work together in the future, I'd love that very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.